<laughs> there we go. Hi, this is Paul. And uh, Zoom just stumbled, but now uh, um, seems to have recovered. Uh, the, today we have a ver we have a an anticipated meeting. I'm gonna make a little opening statement before we jump into this. I don't think we'll have any problem. Uh, both of these men are are very able talkers, and so we won't have any trouble filling up our time. Um, this part of how this arose is um, I watched Jordan's conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, and it was also during the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series that I was doing sporadic commentaries on some of the episodes, and the Luther episode really caught my attention, and I, I also thought that... Um, there needed to be a lot more definition in terms of. I, I thought I heard a lot of Calvinism and Lutheranism, and um, and, and and so I I thought you know at once I heard Jordan talk to Jonathan. I really enjoyed Jordan's conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, and so then I contacted Jordan and John Verveke and said, you know, you guys should talk, and um, but that was late in the spring, and both. John and I had very chaotic summers, and so it really didn't come about. And then Jordan contacted me a couple of months ago and said, you know, this never happened. Why don't you and I talk? And so then we did that conversation, which is on my channel. And then we've had some videos going back and forth. And I um, and so to to actually have some dialogos, um, I thought, you know, it would be great if we would, if if the three of us would talk together and both John and Jordan agreed, nice to do it on a neutral channel. I don't see a big risk of conflict here. Um, I've watched all of the videos passing back and forth. And while um, there certainly can be an interesting conversation had about um, who was Martin Luther and let's say the search for the historical Luther. Um, and there are also really big questions about how individual leaders participate in vast historical movements. And we can certainly talk about the fact that a lot of what was swirling around Luther, you know, was was stuff that was happening far more broadly. And so you have always this question with historical debates, to what degree is the man responsible or the movement responsible? And that's that's a question that is seldom ever answered, I think. And I've had very similar things in my past with uh, Richard Muller um, taught, he, he led the PhD program at Calvin Seminary. I wasn't in the PhD program, but um, uh, Nathan, oh, I can't remember his name, went to the PhD program at Calvin Seminary and then went Orthodox. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with him, but he went to Westminster and wrote a rather famous paper at this point, was Calvin a Calvinist? Because part of what happens with a lot of these movements, Luther wouldn't like it, that there's an offshoot of the church named Lutheranism. Calvin wouldn't like it. There's there's a tradition named Calvinism. But usually these movements are named by their enemies and the names stick. And so we're sort of stuck with those titles. So having listened to both of these men, I've listened to more of John works than Jordan's work. But I also recommend a video that Jordan made recently with Gavin Ortland. Is that get yes. his name right? Yeah. On Protestantism. And I made a little video on big P versus little P Protestantism because what I appreciate about both of these men and what I think they actually have in common is a desire to wrestle significantly with modernity and what that has done in the church, what that has done far beyond the church. Both of these men are deeply interested in recovering um, resources from the past that in many ways have sort of been pushed to the side in the haste of modernity. And I think also um, what perhaps... I've heard both Gavin and Jordan express in various videos their frustration in sort of watching the Jordan Peterson phenomenon and then watching the development with John and Jonathan Peugeot and, and feeling, where are the Protestants in this conversation? Now, I always say, well, we've got at least one of them here because I am most decidedly a Protestant. But I think their point is that 
a lot of this does focus on focus around issues that brought Protestantism, both big P and little P, into the fore. And I, I think there is within many Protestants a desire to address many of these same issues that Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot, and John Verveke are addressing we, I think, sometimes have a little bit more difficulty because we are a little bit bound into internal conflicts within both big P and little p Protestantism on these matters. So my position has always been sort of between John Verveke's non-theism and Jonathan Peugeot's orthodoxy. I've sort of been in the middle saying, um, yeah, I don't think the Protestant Reformation was really avoidable. And I think Actually, a lot of the scholarship written by Roman Catholics and some Protestants on uh, that period in time notes that what we call the Protestant Reformation, usually focusing on Luther, is really a whole wave coming through of many different reformations, including mm -hmm. the Counter-Reformation. So um, I wanted to say that if some of you are anticipating a YouTube dry, you know, big battle between these two was luther a good guy yes or no um i don't think that's going to happen and um and so i wanted to set the table and i think these two are now going to um really have a very fruitful and in my opinion much more interesting conversation not just on debating luther but on okay how can we wrestle with what's really happened over the last 500 years and really with an eye towards how do we move forward together? So there's my there's my opening statement. So I'll, I'll leave it to um, either of you to, to offer an opening well, statement, and then we'll, I'll, we'll see where we want to start. I won't make an opening statement. I'll just make a couple of uh, qualifying things. I, I'm, I, I, I do not want to get involved in sort of interdenominational conflict. Um, I'm not competent, and I'm not desirous of that. So... Um, I won't be, uh, I sort of, I, I will refuse to get involved that way. I am happy to talk about Christianity um, and, and Protestantism, So, but I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't have the competence to do that, nor do I have the desire. Um, the other thing is, um, I've already admitted in my video that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that in some ways I may have villainized uh, Luther unfairly, and um, uh, I've tried to take responsibility for that and offer a, both an apology and amends. And, and the ways in which I've tried to correct that. And so I'm not, I, I'm also not interested in uh, either villainizing him or or, 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 or I don't know what, raising him on a pedestal or something like that. Um, I'm much more interested in the questions you brought up and uh, the, 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 the stuff that I'm interested um, is like, for example, Jordan, in your book, you know, The Truth and Good and the Beautiful, you have an analysis that is re remarkably similar uh, I think in important ways. There's differences. I'm not saying it's identical, but it's yeah, no, I think they, similar. I think they are very, very similar. And I've noticed yeah. that listening to some of your lectures that I have, it seems like yeah. you certainly have some overlapping uh, areas of of interest and and a, and overlapping criticisms of, of modernity as well. Yeah, and uh, and so I'm I'm really interested in 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 in, in trying to draw them out, uh, and I'm interested in and you ma you make some very powerful claims, um, and I'm not denying them about you know Luther's connection to his preference for Plato over Aristotle. And of course, that's consonant with the, the shift that's also happening in the scientific revolution. Uh, Copernicus, right. Galileo, uh, Kepler are, pro are prioritizing Plato over Aristotle. And that's why math, as Heidegger argues, becomes the, the quintessential feature of modern science and why it's completely absent from Aristotelian science. Mm -hmm. So there's part of this overall general move. And, and so I'm really interested in talking to you about that. And um Maybe an opening question is, what do you, and and I agree with Paul, I want to really welcome the Protestants to this discussion. You've convinced me that you have something important to say. So I, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> right. Um, I, I want to I start by what do you think the possible relationship is to the, I'll call it the platonic, neoplatonic, because I want to do the whole arc, yeah. that whole tradition. Sure. 
what is what is the proper relation? Is it recoverable? Uh, and then, you know, and I'm talking to other people like from the different traditions, uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition about, you know, uh, Christianity's relationship to Neoplatonism. He, uh, Bishop likes to talk about the transfiguration of Neoplatonism within Christianity, sure. which, is, which is, and so those are the things I really, and I'm really talking in depth with him about, I want to, I want to understand that better. Um, and when, and, and, you know, and feel free to, uh, you know, indicate why you think uh, or how you think why and how you think protestantism can say something new or relevant or something that may have been backgrounded that should be foregrounded etc is that a fair enough opening gesture yeah yeah no i think that, i think that sounds good i so for the record my my dissertation was written on the topic of uh, the philosophy of luther and then the the next century of lutherans and what, what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do in my dissertation, which is now published as the first of a series of books, is trying to counter a narrative that you often find in, that really develops in some post-Kantian thinkers in the late 19th century, in the way that they interpret Luther and then Protestantism as a whole. So this goes beyond just the figure of Luther, uh, which essentially says that the Reformation in and of itself was a rejection of, of classical philosophy. Uh, and and even a rejection of metaphysics altogether. So my my argument has been that that's just not the case. And my my argument is that is not just from Luther. I'm not primarily really a Luther scholar. Um, I, I love Luther, but my interest is really more so in the next generations, largely this, the 17th century, uh, of, of among Protestants. And that would include, uh, as Paul mentioned, Richard Muller, who's a the scholar at Calvin who's done all this work on uh, the Reformed tradition is both the Lutheran and Reformed traditions were very much indebted to the Greek philosophical traditions. Now they differ on certain points and obviously some figures lean more toward Plato, more toward Aristotle in, in other ways. Um, but generally when you're talking about like a classical realist philosophy of, of the ancient Greeks, there was a pretty high evaluation of those thinkers. And, and there was also a pretty heavy, heavy utilization of someone like a Thomas Aquinas among, mm -hmm. among those thinkers. Mm -hmm. So my, it, when I see a lot of people who are kind of encountering the crisis that we're facing today, which obviously we're, we're all in recognition, that's why this, this conversation is happening is because we're at a moment of crisis like, culturally mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I see a lot of Christians moving into the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions. And I have some of the same sympathies that they do, but I wanna say that the broader Christian tradition uh, beyond just those movements also have these, a lot of the same concerns in terms of tradition. We obviously have a, very, a somewhat different view of tradition. Um, what I would say maybe is the uniqueness about Protestantism. Uh, and this comes from a, the phrase that I often use, it comes from a guy named Charles Krauth, who's a 19th century American Lutheran theologian. Um, and he uses the, he has got had a, he has a book called the Conservative Reformation, and in that book he distinguishes between different approaches to change in the church and and I think that you can take this principle much more broadly than just the church, um, but theologically he speaks about you know kind of a traditionalism which he identifies with Rome, which tends to say because it's older it's probably better. And then you have a kind of radicalism, which he identifies with some of the more radical wing of the Reformation, which says that which is new is is better, you know, kind of throw out the past, remove tradition. And what he defends is what he calls the conservative Reformation, which is an approach that says that we retain the past, we retain our traditions, we see ourselves as in union with, you know, the church as it has been, but we are also open to change to some degree. But that mm -hmm. change hope happens, uh, I think, slowly, carefully, and we don't just kind of, you know, throw it out and go back to the text of Scripture as a source that is totally isolated from the rest of the history and traditions that developed around it, um, or you know, throwing out like interpretive communities altogether. We're just saying the interpretive community is fallible, not infallible, which is mm -hmm. kind of where the the difference would be. So, so I would see that as in some ways parallel to, say, the development of uh, conservatism in, in, say, politics with someone like an Edmund Burke, right, mm -hmm. who, who would say that there is, just as, as Westerners or people in general, we, we all have traditions. We are not born as isolated individuals, but we're born into communities. We're born into communities that, that have, you know, views of morality and, and truth and ritual and all of those kinds of things. And there is a process of change. This doesn't mean we have to be stuck in the past, 
but you don't do this by kind of overthrowing the past. So, so my, my argument there would be, I think that the approach that you find, especially within the Lutheran reformers of, of both conserving, but also being open to reform is in my view, something that speaks beyond even just the church into some of these broader cultural conversations where we're saying, what is our relationship to the past? Specifically, you know, the, the classical sources. So um, is the idea then that um, Protestantism is proposing um, some kind of reciprocal reconstructive relationship between the tradition and what's going on? Like we, you, you learn from the past, but you're willing to critique the past as well. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get clearer about what does that mean in sort of philosophical yeah, yeah, practice. yes, yeah. So yeah. That, that's what I would say. Um, I, I think that. There, there obviously have to be some kind of primary, primary commitments that kind of underlie our, our belief systems. So what I'm not saying is everything is open to kind of throwing it out or changing. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and to me, the kind of underlying principles would be really a classical realism, classical metaphysics. So some of the the foundations in in Plato, but also in Aristotle, and, and we could talk about the relationship between Plato and Aristotle. Um, no, I'd like I to. Think yeah, yeah, yeah we, um, we should. Um, but but I think when we're talking about a classical realism, especially as opposed to like a more nominalist approach. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Um, I mean, that that tends to be my, I tend to see modernity going off the rails first there. I do but too. I, I, I argue that. I argue that yes. with Rotham and, uh, and with a little bit more with Scotus. It's not Scotus. It's not so much the nomalism. It's the unifocacity of being uh, a flat, yes. a, a flattened ontology. Uh, that I think was very problematic. I think I agree with you totally on that. And then you also see Descartes as a pivotal figure. Uh, Absolutely, the I, yes. Uh, the way I do too. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm really interested in like So I'll, I'll, I'll say something and it's not meant to be brusque. It's It, it might be a little bit stark. I like... I, you know, I, I, I attended many different uh, 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 Protestant churches, some of them Lutheran, conservative and liberal, and, you know, attended them for long periods. Uh, and it's hard for me to see this in what I saw in those churches. Like, I don't see the Platonism. I don't see the Neoplatonism. I, and, and, and this this is not, this isn't even an argument. I'm making a statement and I'm trying to provoke you where it's easy for me to see it when I walk into an Eastern Orthodox church. I can just, sure. it's literally on the walls. They're using these Greek terms. They're invoking, they invoke the noose as, a, as an important part of their ideas about salvation. I, it, like it's dripping in this stuff in a powerful way. And I see that I never heard this at all in any of these churches I attended and belonged to. And so I'm not denying what you're saying. I'm asking you, what, how do you respond to that? That, that, that? One one easy thing I could say is, well, the reason why people go to the Eastern Orthodox rather than to a Protestant church is because it's, 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 it's not just talked about propositionally in theology, it's exemplified non-propositionally in the art, yeah. in the symbolism, et cetera. Yeah, and it should be. <laughs> and I think you're absolutely oh. right. I, I, yeah. I, I, I reject the idea that... And no offense, Paul, with your Calvinist background, but <laughs> I, uh, you oh, know, it's going to be like this. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we're just going to pile on you for Calvin. No, I uh, <laughs> coming from a Calvinist background, I, I very much, which is why I, in some ways I really um, I align with a lot of the people who have converted to, say, Eastern Orthodoxy and that I had a lot of similar concerns. And uh, from from a more Calvinistic background in the Presbyterian Church that, that I was involved in, the the theology was very much propositional, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the focus of the service was very much on a sermon, which was really a theological lecture in a yes. lot of ways. And I enjoy a good theological lecture, but but it really just engaged the mind and it didn't really engage the body in, in the same kind yes. of way. Yes. And and I think some of it is I was <laughs> I was lucky enough to have my first Lutheran church experience be in a very highly liturgical congregation uh -huh. that's that was I mean, very similar in a lot of ways to what you'd experience at a Roman Catholic mass, just, you know, without the Marian prayers and, yeah. and some of the other and some of the other things. But, you know, the wearing of vestments and, you know, you kneel and you stand and you, your body is engaged. Um, so I, I would also say that in in your experience, unfortunately, that's the experience a lot of people have. 
Yeah. Okay. And thank I, you for that. That's, so, that. Thank you for that. Yeah. No. So, so I think you're right. I, and I know my, my project is, is a bit controversial, even among Lutherans. I certainly have some, uh, some who, who vehemently disagree with my interpretation of Luther and Lutheranism. So I'll just right. be, be blunt about that. Um, but well, that makes me art... want to that makes me want to even more talk to you then. Uh, so keep okay, going, yeah, please. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to think that the last about hundred years of of Lutheran theology has really devolved philosophically, ah. and it, and what I have what led to the writing of my dissertation um, when I came into Lutheranism, I was reading. I was a college student and I was just reading theology books all the time. Uh, and uh, I would get these like old Lutheran books out of the library and reformed books. And I was trying to decide like where I wanted to end up theologically. And I did go visit the local Eastern Orthodox church. And um, so as I was reading, I was really reading a lot of, of 17th century through late 19th century sources. And I, I fell in love with the, the theology and, and way that these people approached their faith but as I started, it, and that, that's what convinced me of Lutheranism, as I started attending a Lutheran church, it was a wonderful congregation, but I started uh, reading some more contemporary works, and I realized that, it, that the, the theology and practices that I was reading there were very different from what I had encountered and what, what had really brought my interest within the Lutheran tradition. Particularly, it, it, it was the notion of, of a, a union with Christ. And I'm talking about a participatory ontological union. Okay, um, very interesting. Uh, so where, yeah, where, where, just to interrupt briefly, where's the bifurcation point? Like, where does it go? Where does it, where does it go from what you... Like you, you said, there's been a, there's a there's a pivot point at which it moves yes, away yes. and loses touch. W where's that happening, and why did it happen? Yeah, I tend I I see the real key figure as Albrecht Ritual there, and uh, Ritual, you know, nineteenth century, probably the second most important figure in Protestant liberalism after Schleiermacher, and yeah. Ritual was very much a Kantian. And ah. Ritchell engaged in, in a Luther study, and he wrote these two volumes on the Doctrine of Justification, but essentially he read Luther in a very Kantian context. And particularly, and, and this, this work has been, I'm not the one who discovered this, it's some Finnish scholars that have started, that started writing on this, um, that they discovered when Ritchell started talking, reading texts where Luther talks about union with Christ. So he says, for example, in his Galatians commentary, that Christ is present in faith. There is this ontological union that the believer has with, with Christ. He started to see that union as a union of moral wills. Uh, my uh, moral will is aligned with Jesus's external moral will. So any participatory metaphysic is gone in that. Right, of course. If it's Kantian framework, it has to be gone. E exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then ritual becomes really the founding figure for what is called the Luther Renaissance at the beginning of the 20th century. And the Luther Renaissance, uh, Carl Hull was a major figure there and, and some others, but that ended up really being probably the definitive group of scholars in terms of influencing Luther scholarship throughout the, the 20th century. It's, okay, so, um, so it's, there's it's, the short of it, but. Right, so it's a, it's a Kantian turn. Um, yes. So, so what, what does that, does that mean then um, that most of the churches of today are influenced by that, uh, I, I want to call it sort of post-Kantian Lutheranism, as opposed to the Lutheranism that you're uh, talking about? Is, is, am I understanding you correctly? I think it depends. Uh, okay. There, There is a, I, I think it has had a significant impact, that post-Kantian kind of Lutheranism. Uh, I have seen in recent years a strong turn away from that. So I, I think that things are starting to shift in the other direction. So I'm not going to say it's the entirety of the Lutheran tradition, but very significant neo-Kantian figures really impacted. They're really the most significant Lutheran theologians of the last century. So it, it the impact has not been small, <laughs> I'll say. Okay. okay. But but I, it's I, but it hasn't been entire. It's not like every you know Lutheran seminary or pastor or professor is is essentially neo-Kantian. But, but honestly, a large portion of them are or at least influenced by it to some extent. So is there, so fill me in on the history too then. Like, so other than Boheme, I'm not familiar with any great Protestant mystics, which is another reason why I find the mm. disconnection from the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition, uh, because, you know, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Catholic tradition, uh, and they produce a lot of uh, very important mystics. And 
Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, you know, the Neoplatonism forms a kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of theoretical grammar for them by which they interpret and understand their mystical experiences and try to wed them to sure, um, sure. their Christian allegiance. And so, I, I, like, and I get, I, I, I acknowledge Bohem as a, a clear, um, <laughs> you know, a clear counterexample. I'm not, but yeah, yeah. He, he, he seems like the exception to the rule that there aren't great Protestant mystics um, that make a, a serious impact on the theology and the practice of Lutheranism. Like, now, am I in? Is that an unfair judgment, or or is it part of this history that you're talking about? Uh, I, I, it's an open question. I want to hear what you have to say about. Yeah, that. sure. So I'd say I'd say it's it's somewhat accurate and somewhat not. Okay. okay. So I think, and to, to explain that, I would say the, the Lutheran tradition has always had, it, this goes back to some of Luther's uh, debates with the Anabaptists, right? Luther was encountering a lot of these figures who were who were insisting that God was giving them these kind of mystical visions or nice. uh, was telling them that they could set themselves up as a kind of prophet. And, and so Luther was very cautious, and the early Lutherans were, of internal experiences in terms of them being some kind of you know kind of supreme authority right and and so the emphasis always was on the external word of god the external calling um external things rather than the internal now what what that doesn't mean though is that the internal experiences don't exist <laughs> or that they're unimportant it's just mm. that they have to be relegated to kind of the proper context i think within lutheranism so uh I mean, I could point you to a number of figures who, well, there's a there's a, a book that was written in the beginning of the 20th century by a guy named Junius Remensteiner called the, the Lutheran Manual. And he's discussing the differences of Calvinist piety and Lutheran piety. And he, he defines Lutheran piety as a mystical piety, which is in opposition to the Reformed, ah. which, which is very interesting. So the and in more recent years, Lutherans are like any term that's mysticism is is we want to kind of move away from that. But right. I don't think historically that's the case. So I would say that's part of the shift as well. So someone like uh, Johann Gerhard, who's the Lutheran theologian that I you mentioned him in your book. Most. You mentioned him in yes. your book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he has he has a number of, of what would be considered kind of more mystical writings, and he even is reliant to some degree on some of those medieval mystics that influenced Luther. And I know you mentioned some of these in your talk, yeah, the, the Rhineland mystics, Tauler yeah, yeah, yeah. being yeah. A, a really significant name, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux being another really significant yeah. figure. Um, it, but I would point to someone like uh, Johann Arndt, who his book, True Christianity, was the, uh, it, it was like at the time, the best selling Christian book other than the Bible. Uh, and this was, at least it was throughout the, the 17th century. Uh, and even into the 18th century, where Johann Arndt's True Christianity actually became a textbook at Russian in Russian Orthodox seminaries. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> which is such a weird connection. Yeah, so, yeah. But it was very much mystical. So, so I would say that, and even to the point that, you know, the Orthodox are, are reading Arndt. So I would say that the, the Lutheran tradition, I think, is mystical, but it's more cautiously mystical. It, it, it's more cautious in its not wanting to make internal experience the kind of criterion of truth. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So does that, do, do you think that affords Protestantism as you understand it with the resources? I, like I'm, I, I'm very opposed to, I'm, I, I'm very convinced perhaps I should put it by, by, yeah. by, you know, by new way uh, scholarship on Platonism, that Platonism is ultimately about uh, the non-propositional, it's about transformation, um, that, uh, you, you know, t t talking about just the theory of the form, Plato doesn't have a theory of the forms, he doesn't even actually, he had, he talks about the forms, but to, sure. to call it a theory is, I think, a, a misnomer and a misleading misnomer in a powerful way. Um, and this is a lot of stuff I'm exploring in the new series after Socrates. And it, and that means that there's an inherent connection and there's a deep connection between the non-propositional mystical transformation. Um, uh, and, and so do you think that Protestantism has the resources to talk deeply? I mean, I was brought up and you've been critical of that, but I, you know, I, it's, I didn't make this stuff up. It was an education I got about, you know, sure. Protest yeah. Protestantism was re rejecting the Greek philosophy and uh, uh, defending the he Hebraic tradition from how it was infected and uh, degenerated by, by the Greek tradition. I mean, I, I was taught that in university kind of stuff, right? It's not, I didn't like, and so 
it sounds like you're saying, and and and, and this is really interesting. Do you, do you think? Do you think that Protestants want to hear this? And you, you, you're a controversial figure, and I'm putting you in a spot. And if you want to, and if you want to beg off from that, I, I'm totally open no, to okay. that. But do you think that you know that Lutherans want to hear that that you know? I would put it this way. I think I would make an argument. I want to hear what you think about it. I would make an argument mm -hmm. that responding to the meaning crisis, awakening from the meaning crisis, re requires this deep new rereading of the and reappropriation. I, I even call it exaptation of the whole Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition, if we're going to come up with a viable alternative that can nevertheless um, have well, what I would consider scientific respectability. I'm not, I, I, I don't, I, like you, I'm not, I'm not a positivist. I don't think that science is the sole generator of knowledge or sure. that, right, right. Naturalism should talk about what's presupposed by science, not what just is derivable from it, et cetera. Um, and so do you think, do you think Protestants want to hear this message? Um, uh, and, um, I mean, that, that's a tricky question to ask, and, and, and I, I, I hope, I hope you're you're getting that I'm asking it respectfully. I'm asking it. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. In, in friendship, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to corner you for a, a philosophical jujitsu move or anything like that. I want it like, <laughs> like, 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 because my concern has been that um, I, I, I see, uh, and you know, and I have. Huge exceptions to the rule. Here is one with us in this room uh, of people who want from the Protestant tradition uh, to enter into deep discussion with the proposal I'm making. And they have, and I listen to their criticisms. Um, sure. But that has not been my experience, again, of, of Protestants in general. And, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm worried that I've formed an inappropriate stereotype. And that's why I'm opening, I'm asking you the question. Uh, maybe I'm asking both of you. Do Protestants really want to hear this? Do they really want to hear it? And I don't mean just hear it in la 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 in a Hallmark card fashion, but like hear it in a way in which, oh wow, I might be needing to practice my Christianity differently if I'm really going to give the world a viable response to the meaning crisis. It's a challenging question, I admit it, but I want to ask you. I I'd like to interject a couple of thoughts yeah. into this answer yeah. that I think Jordan can probably be helpful with, and this will also <laughs> touch on Luther actually. Okay. Because, you know, if you remember in Thunder Bay, uh, Jordan, we had a conference, myself, Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke in Thunder Bay, um, Ontario, where in person, we're going to have another conference in May in um, in Southern California. Much nicer locale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad the Canadians said that. <laughs> The people treated us wonderfully in Thunder Bay. Thunder I, Bay I, was amazing. I, yeah, yeah. I love traveling up north. I just don't know if I want to live there. Um, <laughs> um, part of, I think, what we're wrestling with, with your question, John, what, one of the things I want to say about churches, churches are the very messy application of yes. a ton. And I think part of the story of what has been happening with the church over the, you know, really since the 19th century is there are many, many other forces which are not necessarily coming from theological traditions that are impacting the church. I mean, we've had this enormous disruption via technology, social movements, and everything. And these have, I think, across the board, probably impacted churches to a far greater degree than theological traditions, which has brought about the fact that you can find uh, churches across the traditional spectrum that look very much alike because they are all in many ways responding to social and technical and market forces rather than necessarily theological trajectories. That's one important thing when you look at churches and labels and churches and practice. Just okay. that, that comment. Second comment with respect to this is I think when you look at the very long arc of the church, which is, I think, what both of you want to look at, in a way, looking at, obviously, the emergence of Christianity from Judaism, uh, the split from Judaism that Christianity makes, because Christianity and Judaism really are sort of a, a splitting from each other because of Jesus Christ. And we have to talk about why in the Protestant Reformation, monasticism was sort of put to the side, and I think in many ways, part of what you see in Protestantism is, is popular piety 
replacing a lot of the functions of monasticism in a different realm. And for example, you might, this is where you get into the definition of Protestantism. Most of us would accept that Pentecostals are, I'll call them small p Protestants. Um, very, some of them, you know, very few of them are probably big P Protestants, but that would probably be the ones with advanced theological degrees, temperaments that lend them towards bookishness, et cetera, et cetera. Pietism, I think, has been popularist mysticism in some ways for the church. If um, if you go to a Pentecostal service um, all around the world right now, Pentecostalism is by far the fastest growing branch of Christianity in places like Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Mm -hmm. There is definitely a mystical quality to the liturgy that has emerged in these worship traditions. Now, there's plenty to discuss with respect to deployment and endurance and all of those things. But when we're asking questions about, about mysticism within the Protestant realm, I don't think we should ignore the role that pietism has played in that process. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's important, but um, towards something Jordan said earlier, I mean, Kant's big influence is pietism. Um, it's a profound influence on him. Uh, and um, it, 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 I mean, and I, I see it uh, coming, uh, ramifying that way. I see it, it, it uh, you know, Jordan, I think you said something earlier about uh, union of wills, union of moral wills. Yes. Uh, kind yep. of that vision coming out. Um, and I, that's where I, 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 I see it cashing out. So I, I'm interested in it. Was, was there, I guess there, what you're saying, Paul, is there's a, there's a pre-Kantian pietism and there's something like that happening in Pentecostalism or is that stretching what you're saying too far? I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily pre-Kantian, but in terms of, you know, when, when John, when I look at your project to engage the meaning crisis, mm -hmm. a, a deep part of the meaning crisis, I, I haven't had a chance to, to do any video work on your talk with Jordan recently, but really interesting, um, some really interesting Jordan Peterson. segments. Jordan, Jordan Peterson. Peterson. By the way, I'm, I, I'm infested <laughs> with, with Jordans right now. There's Jordan That's Peterson, right. Jordan Hall, uh, That's right. Jordan Cooper right here, and then I'm going to be talking to Jordan Wood uh, this Saturday. So I got, <laughs> I got, I got. I hope I don't mix up my Jordans. Uh, so please. Uh, just, just trying to confuse you here. <laughs> but, but in terms of, I mean, a, a big piece of the meaning crisis is, I think, um, to to wed heaven and earth. And I know, John, you've been very clear about, you know, two worlds mythologies. Yes. Um, yes. Pentecostals very much practice the wedding of heaven and earth liturgically, but not with iconography, not with, no. not with, let's say, traditional monastic practice, but usually with music, and and but they obviously have developed their own liturgies. I, I one of my uncles was uh, Pentecostal, so I got to go to some of the services. Uh, which, as coming from a fundamentalist, uh, I guess Calvinist, uh, given the, the theological distinctions you guys are making, uh, uh, church was terrifying for me. Uh, but now I, I looking back <laughs> on it, um, uh, you know, I, I, I a lot of the stuff I'm talking about about what happens in in dialogos and the we space uh, and, and and that. And that that emergent spirit, and then how it gives you a sense of being not only intimate with each other and with yourself, uh, but to something like what I would call the logos, the intelligibility of reality. Uh, I, I see that there's something. Well, at least it seems to me retrospectively. I want to be careful here uh, that, that, that there's a lot of there's a lot of ecstasis at least going on in, in Pentecostal yep. services, which I think is part of mysticism. But I want to be really careful, and, uh, and I want to be really careful. Before and then I want to shut up so that Jordan can answer. I, I'm I'm I don't want to just I, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep the two things together that were together in Neoplatonism: the deep philosophical development and the mystical transformation. And they and they and they and they are not just coincidentally together. I would argue they are essentially right. uh, interpenetrating. And then my question comes from that. 
and that's that would that. be missing in a lot of most Pentecostalism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm not, and I, I don't want to, you know, insult the Pentecostal traditions by. Yeah. Yeah. By yeah, I don't want to do like, yeah. 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 And I, and I, I haven't um, spent a significant amount of time at Pentecostal services, but at least in my experience, that I, I don't know that the focus is so much on actual lasting transformation as it is on kind of a momentary ecstasy. I mean, that's at least in my experience. So okay. for, for what that's worth. Um, now I forget what the original question well, I, I'd is. Like, you know, the the original question. I, I think it's an important piece of this transition. It sure. is. And that's a nice name for that, that deep interweaving of, uh, of, of philosophy and mysticism and also theology. But I, I'm talking about this part right now. And, and my question was, given, given that we've got a little bit clearer about that, do you think Protestants are really open? And I don't mean in a polite, tolerant way. I mean, in a sure. responsible and responsive way to hearing that. I mean, if you take that seriously, it, it should have impact on your practice, on your ritual, on your understanding, uh, on, on some of the conceptual vocabulary you want to adopt, etc. Right? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I think if you... Okay, for example, I um, I went to the Evangelical Theological Society um, this fall. I was presenting. It was the first time they'd ever had a, a session of just Lutherans uh, presenting there, and I mean, listening to a lot of the talks, and, and these are people from all from various Christian churches and traditions of all different kinds. I mean, you had talks on on participation. There were talks on you know classical theism, doctrines of divine simplicity. Uh, there is a growing interest in a lot of classical philosophical sources among wow. Protestants right now. Yeah. So there, there has been a huge shift in the last 10 years that's really accelerated in the last five years. Mm. Mm. So with, within the academy, and this is going from Lutheran to Presbyterian to Baptist, I mean, churches from, from very different traditions that are really trying to recapture a lot of this. Because, and this is largely kind of younger theologians because we've seen all the problems that you're seeing right we've, we've yeah. seen all of the reasons why people are going to say orthodoxy or or to rome and we're recognizing that those are real issues so i actually think there's a going to be a major shift that's already begun really significantly uh toward reevaluating a lot of those classical uh traditions wow that's re that, thank you for that answer that's a very significant answer so i mean I'm hearing you say, and if I get it wrong, please say. But I'm hearing you say there's been, a, a, you know, a recognition of uh, of the meaning crisis and an inadequacy yes. that needs to be significantly addressed if the Lutheran Church or maybe the broader the Protestant Church is going to be able to offer, uh, you know, a significant voice in this. Um, am I hearing you right? Yes. Yes. That, that that's exactly right. So so I wouldn't. I mean I. I'm sure that there are, and in fact, I know that there are plenty of other Protestants that are paying attention to your to your project because when I, you know, had mentioned it in my Discord server, a number of people are like, "Oh, I, I listen. I've listened to all of his talks." And, uh, so, so there are Protestants paying attention, and they're the Protestants that are very interested in classical Protestantism. Right. So there, there is this growing movement that you know maybe you're you're just not seeing, but it is there. And I anticipate it growing pretty significantly. That, first of all, that's important to know. Uh, and yeah. I, like, uh, I'm really happy to be talking to you because if, if you're a representative of this, um, I think that's powerful. Um, so, do you do you do you think that? I just want to press a little bit more on this question. Do you think? Oh that yeah, yeah. You you think that will trans? I'll I'll use this word. I hope it's the right word. Do you think that will translate into liturgy? Like, will, yes, will yes. it bring about litur liturgical transformation? Do you, do you foresee that? Yes, absolutely. Wow. It's always, it's always tied to liturgical transformation. It has to be because you, you I mean, you, you don't get interested in the classical traditions and just argue propositionally. I, I just don't yes, know you that you can, can you stay can. in the classical no, traditions can. and do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. That's yeah. right. I think that's deeply right. So, uh, I, <laughs> I mean, this is fascinating to me and, 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 and the, I mean, I, I want to now make a distinction. I don't know if I, there's something like a distinction between classical 
uh, uh, and modern. And now uh, what, what you're, you're hearkening back to the classical, but you're also trying to respond to postmodernity. And I don't want to call yes. you postmodern Lutherans because that would have the, exactly the wrong connotation. Yeah, yeah, don't say that. We're, we're all postmodern. <laughs> you'll, you'll, really, you'll really get me in trouble there. <laughs> no, but the, but you see what I, I'm trying to come up with a yeah. way of, of positioning you. Uh, you're, you're obviously not this, not just nostalgic. You're, you're, right. you're, 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 I hear you saying that there are resources within what you've called a couple times classical Lutheranism, classical Protestantism, yes, that yes. can be like exapted, re reappropriated. I like the word you use the word inventio, discovered and also made. Sure, yeah, so yeah. That we, we can, and, 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 which will translate into ritual and practice in a real yes, transformative yes. way. Yeah, there, that, I mean, there are some people that have tried to come up with with terms. I know that the Baptist theologian Craig Carter talks about Christian Platonism. I mean, they just, that's a pretty but simple way not? to talk about it. I mean, it. I've got an entire yeah. book entitled that Christian Platonism. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, really pivotal figures like Gerson and other are in there. And I've been very interested. I've, I've often said explicitly, and I'll say it publicly again, um, although I, you know, I have a profound um, allegiance or loyalty to Socrates. I mean, I actually prefer uh, Christian Neoplatonism over pagan Neoplatonism because of the development of agape uh, uh, and sure. also other important ideas about um, the dialogical. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, Nicholas of Cusa represents the culmination of the Socratic arguments around mm -hmm. learned ignorance. It becomes learned ignorance. Sure. In and, and how, like, how are people pronouncing it now? I was brought up to pronounce it Erigina, but I'm hear hearing people say Erugina. Like what is the what is the oh er Erigina is what I've always yeah, said. Yeah, me heard. too. But I've been hearing people now do this other thing because they do the same thing with Wittgenstein. Every generation switches between the V and the W pronunciation. I don't know. It's a way of showing allegiance or something. Oh, Anyways, I say like, it, I, I say it with a V for whatever that's worth. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, in, in Erigina, I see the you know the culmination of the, this uh, this proposal of that ontology is fu is fundamentally dialectical in the platonic sense not the hegelian sense and yeah, it's sure. equally it's equally uh, top down and bottom up interpenetrating completely uh, through and through and so i i find all of that uh very interesting and promising so i'm hearing you saying that there might be a place within this movement you're talking about for reconsidering those figures even though they're sort of classically understood to belong to the the, the Catholic tradition or something like that. Yeah, I mean, which which figures in particular are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking, I, see, the figures that are, are coming out right now is really important are Erigina and Nicholas of Cusa. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I make the argument in After Socrates because I think they represent sort of, the, you know, the culmination of these two proposals that are, 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 are uh, uh, give birth or uh, given birth in the Socratic Platonic tradition that reality is fundamentally dialectical, dialogical, and that comes mm -hmm. to fruition in Erigina. The, the the division of nature is just that argument just through and through. And then Nicholas of Cusa of learned ignorance as really, really fundamental uh, to uh, the project of wisdom. And people are making uh, uh, sort of significant arguments about how we, ne we need to go back and sort of recover them. Erigina, of course, was sort of declared sort of semi-heretical. It's unclear what, what happened to him. And then Nicholas yeah, Acuso he survived. Was. He survived those threats, but he was always sort of backgrounded. Um, mm -hmm. But many people are like, I was just reading Whitehead um, with Dan Schiappi, uh, The Function of Reason. And he he comes to this little point, and it's a throwaway line. And he says, uh, you know, that you had you, towards the end of scholasticism, after praising scholasticism as really making science possible, he says, then you have this sort of dogmatic rigidity uh, uh, but he says except for nicholas of cusa and if mm. we had followed him modernity would have went another way and then he goes back to his argument and other oh, that's people interesting are, yeah other people are taking this up um in, in a fundamental way and, and so I'm, I'm i'm asking do you think like to, i noticed that you have um and and you you make the case that luther you you have a very uh, positive read on Aquinas in some ways too. Yes, like th th I do. So there's a lot of these figures that belong to th what the Catholic tradition or Dionysus and Maximus um, that I, I I never heard about when I was in the Lutheran uh, world. Uh, but is is are these new theologians that you're talking about? Are they going back? and reconsidering the value of these thinkers um, and what they might help to say about how we can reconnect uh, to, I'll, I'll use your term, Christian Platonism? 
Yeah, I think there there has been, you know, Nicholas of Cusa, I haven't spent a lot of time in myself. And, and I can yeah. say he's he's not, and maybe I should. Um, he's not a figure that I've that I've delved into too much, and I haven't seen much from more classically minded Protestants on on his work. I think Aquinas is probably the major name that people are showing to explore. I would say Maximus to some extent as well. Uh, I well, think Maximus... they're, they're two great integrators, right? They're, they're two yes. really powerful integrators. Yeah, very uh, much so. I think Dionysius is going to be less so influential. And some of the reason for that, uh, Luther had a very, well, Luther had a negative evaluation of Thomas too, but um, right. Luther said of, of Dionysius that he Platonizes more than he Christianizes. And the, I think the reason why he hasn't had as much of an impact as some other more, you know, Neoplatonic theologians is that in many ways, his theology was seen as kind of Christless um, in, in his work. So for that reason, he just hasn't had as big of an impact. Aquinas is has been so significant to the Lutheran tradition that there was a theologian of the 17th century that wrote two volume a two volume work arguing that Thomas Aquinas was actually a Lutheran and he didn't belong to the Roman Catholics. <laughs> you know, Let me write that down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Historically, his argument probably was not correct. But what that does demonstrate is there was this desire for continuity with a lot of these thinkers. And just because Luther had a negative evaluation of Aquinas doesn't mean that everybody else within the tradition did. Sure, sure. I, I'm not I'm not yeah. holding you to that. I, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah, sure. I, 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 I'm, I'm asking questions. I mean, I, 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 I'm in agreement with this sort of a lot of the new scholarship. Uh, that's emerging around Aquinas, and that it's much more proper to see him as a Neoplatonist using Aristotle than an Aristotelian. Um, and I, I think that argument, I, I think the the pagan analog to Aquinas is not is not Aristotle, it's Plotinus. I, I, I think that's the closer analog. And, and, I, and I'm not the only person making that argument. You know, Sebastian Morello is making that um, uh, I think Clark is making that argument. Uh, a lot of people are making that. It, it, this has been really interesting too, uh, because of the possible connections it opens up between Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Um, uh, yeah, that 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 is interesting, and I've 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 read a bit of scholarship kind of debating that point from both sides yes. on Aquinas, yeah. and and I, to be honest, I'm a little bit undecided myself on the question well, okay okay well i mean that's yeah. something uh, yeah i i well you know the fact that he cites dionysus more sure. than aristotle just numerically right uh, and that is very interesting yeah yeah things like that is like there's just sort of even sort of you know objective measures that you just have to account for um uh, so uh, yeah i'm not going to try and make that argument here but i'm just i'm just interested for me i'm interested and this came out in my 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 talk with Jordan Peterson, and also um, the thing the talk I gave at, at Ralston about the convergence between Fourier cognitive science and Neoplatonism. Hmm. I'm interested in this. I don't know what to call it, but but this upsurge uh, of Neoplatonism and, and how it's showing up in many areas, um, in many Christian denominations, and and also other religions, um, hmm. and. I, I'm I'm deeply intrigued uh, by this, and I wonder if you if you if you've noted that or reflected upon that uh, at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, absolutely. I, I've seen a significant. Uh, I'll just. I mean, even even not just from like scholarship. Um, I part of of what I what I do um, is I'm involved in uh, chaplaincy work at Cornell University with students, and I'll just say working with students there there is a hunger for classical sources mm -hmm. there there is just a hunger for i mean they're seeing kind of the meaninglessness around them and, and they know that they need something else um which is what's drawing people toward you know the work of, of peterson or, or others but it also has drawn them towards i think reevaluating a lot of classical sources and, and there's a desire for largely I, I, what i see is a desire for the it's some kind of connectedness to the past yeah, I think there's a connectedness to the past. I think that's definitely it. And then that that brings up issues around tradition again. What do we mean yeah, by connectedness yeah. to the past when, when, when right? Uh, and, uh, and and then there's this. I think there's something else. And this is uh, this has also been part of the of uh, the. Uh, I, I I I guess I want to call it. Maybe this is a little bit hyperbolic, but the revolution in ancient philosophy studies that Hadot brought about, uh, with like really understanding 
uh, ancient philosophy as a way of life, as a set of practices, and that the, the that the transformation of people's character and the cultivation of wisdom was much more important than the theoretical discourse. The theoretical discourse was always in the service of that. And see, one of and I hope you take this as a compliment. It's not meant to be insulting. If it comes off, I apologize ahead of time. One of the things I think uh, Christianity, and also I would say Sufism and Kabbalah, uh, but one of the things the religious versions of Neoplatonism can do is to help provide, I've certainly turned to them for that, help provide a way to maybe not reconstruct because the evidence is too thin, but maybe you know, uh, reverse engineer uh, the Neoplatonic practices. What does what do they mean? Uh, what were people doing? And we can see um, uh, how can we turn Platonism into a way of life, a lived philosophy. Now, I'm happy if many people want to make it Christian Platonism, like you said, but I'm I, I'm not restricted that way. Um, I, I, but sure, sure. Um, and and so, like, what what do you think about that proposal that? Like, it, it, does that feel uh, the, the, like, I'll, 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 I'm getting uh, a little bit personal here, but I, I'm always about like, I'm doing this reverse engineering and it's, it's big, it's a big project in sure, um, sure. after Socrates, but, and I make this clear right from the very first episode, I'm not, I'm, you know, Christian, uh, uh, Christian Neoplatonism and Christian Platonism are helping me a lot in this. And I just told you a few minutes ago how they're helping me do this. Uh, like, and, and is that a project that strikes you as something you'd like to be in dialogue with, or do you view me as an incipient heretic that's about to besmirch <laughs> something precious? Like, and, and I, I'm sorry, but I, do you? I, because my concern is, I, 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 I'm in a difficult problem, and I'm not asking any of you to step away from your doctrines. I'm not asking that, but yeah. I want to be responsible to this with you know with but i'm not a christian and i want to also be responsible yeah, yeah. to to sufistic neoplatonism and and, and and jewish neoplatonism and even the possibilities like expressed in the kyoto school of deep discussion between buddhism and zen and neoplatonism like those things they hold great promise for me and so what do you are do you do you do you want to be in dialogue with that project or do you think that pro project is ultimately uh, irresponsible or uh, uh, sorry I'll, I'll i'll just end with a question mark yeah no it, it's it's a good question and uh i have a lot of thoughts and i'm trying to think of how to best answer it <laughs> so I'm, i mean obviously obviously i'm a christian i'm a christian theologian i'm a yes. pastor i'm yeah. a i'm a president of a seminary i train pastors so that's that that's my main concern right so yeah. uh so my my work is is in and for the church um and and obviously my my concern first and foremost as a Christian is, is the proclamation of Christ and it always will be. Sure. So just to be lay my cards on the table, certainly that that's where I'm coming from. Yes. Um, uh, I will say though, that I, I think we have to, we can distinguish. And I know you kind of, you critiqued Luther's two realms distinction that he has, <laughs> uh, but, but I actually think, I, I think in, in terms of some of these conversations, the two realm distinction can be, can be pretty helpful because it does lay out some groundwork where, there can be collaboration despite some significant disagreements, right? So, so in terms of of the you know kingdom of God, the kingdom what we call the kingdom of the right in popular Lutheran parlance, um, you know that is the church. You know, obviously, you know I'm not going to have you come and preach at my church. Uh, us Lutherans are, are so restrictive that Paul couldn't come preach at my church either. So, uh, okay. uh, sorry, John, but uh, <laughs> John, John, we had a we they had um, communion in Thunder Bay, and John didn't understand exactly. I I saw that. I thought, oh my, this is going to yeah, be yeah. melee. <laughs> we got yeah, Orthodox yeah. and Catholics, and yeah, I know. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, we're we're restrictive like the Orthodox and Catholics are. But anyway, with uh, uh, but but the point is, we also have this other this understanding that that there is this this other realm, which people call sometimes the common kingdom. Uh, in other words, there there is, and we would say this is still ruled by God, and God is the one working in and through it. But and, and I don't I don't like using the term secular because I think that has kind of connotations that I don't like because I, I don't tend to think that there is a 
non-sacred or realm that God is not involved in or something, which kind of could, could sometimes be the, the implication. Yeah, but, I, I, I think um, the, the identification of the secular with the absence of the sacred is is, is a fundamental mistake. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, if, uh, but if we're talking about broader societal issues, um, things outside of, in other words, the function and purpose of the church, I, I don't, I think it's important to be in dialogue about these issues. Good. So, so do I, do I have interest? Yeah, I just think it it is a, uh, it's just important to keep the things distinct, right? So to, to understand where I'm coming from, I understand where you're coming from, which is not a, a Christian perspective, but there absolutely 100% should be dialogue. And I think there could be a bit of cooperation on, cert on certain issues for sure. Well, that's exactly the question I'm leading towards is, yeah. I mean, given what you've you've said and a lot I, I mean could there be significant and important collaboration about responding to the meaning crisis um do you think that's possible um such that it could be you know it could be a message relevant to uh, non-christians um and to nuns n-o-n-e-s uh, because they're suffering and Sure. I, I, and, and and i i you know I, I happen to think that if you if, and i'm not saying you're saying this I'm not saying you're saying this, but if there is, well, first sure. of all, you have to become a Lutheran and then we can help you with the meaning crisis. I think that's putting the cart before the horse <laughs> in a really bad way. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it's putting Descartes before the horse. But anyways, I think, right, it's, it's, it's really, it's a really, uh, I don't think that message is going to work or help. Um, and yeah. so I, I, and Paul, I think will vouch for me on this. I mean, my primary, con I say to people, I want to build a bridge. And if what I do sure. helps people return to their faith or their religion and find meaning in it, I'm happy. But I'm also, I'm also open to people like me who feel they need to leave their faith, and I want that bridge to work for them too. Uh, and and so again, I'm not trying to destroy anybody's faith, uh, but I think there is. Uh, we have to recognize that the nuns are not going to simply. Oh yes. Right. I think there's other things that have to happen. Um, and so yeah, I guess in terms what, of, of like kind of how I, I relate to that, I would say, you know, you're reading my book. So I, I, I think that that particular book was meant for a broader audience. So I, I'm not that's just why I read it. I'm reading it. Yeah. 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 So I guess I, maybe I'll ask you, what do you think about it? I mean, what do you think? Do you, do you I, think I'm, I mean, I'm I, I, like, to like, broader? I mean, I'm in agreement. I mean, I have detailed criticisms. Like I think the the the, the stuff on Plato, without talking about uh, uh, the lived uh, you know practices around Socrates and Socratic dialogue or the dialogical form, but that's those are sure. those are scholastic uh, criticisms. Sure. I think the the overarching. I mean, I said it at the beginning. There's so much similarity between your diagnosis and mine um, that it like it, it it's. Um, I, I yeah I think what you're doing is valuable um I, I think it's important and, and you, uh, you your description your diagnosis um now I'm concerned like I said about and this is where you will disagree with me but um sure. like I, I'm concerned with the possibility of creating liturgical ritual ascesis and hado's sense uh for people um, that might not want to belong to a church, a temple, a synagogue, or a mosque, and yet nevertheless can give them viable ways of reconnecting to the non-propositional -pro uh, connectedness to the love of the true, the good, and the beautiful in a way that can be deeply transformative. And I would say that I have some pretty good scientific evidence that that is a a real project. We can make that difference in people's lives. We can move them away from despair. We can move them away from meaninglessness. We can move them away from all the deleterious effects of not having meaning in life or not being able to deal with massive self-deception within themselves or between them and other people. I, I like. I'm very. I think I have good reason and evidence to say that that is is doable and it is being done. And I want to afford that project more and more. That's how I would answer you. Sure. And I mean, obviously you're coming from a scientific perspective and I'm not, I'm yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I'm not, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in the sciences uh, and uh, never will because I'll make myself look like an idiot. So um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm so, not, tr I'm not trying to argue from authority. I'm just trying to say, Oh no, 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 you're, yeah. you're no, I, I'm just, I'm just saying that's my deficiency. I can't, I just can't speak to those issues. And, and I try to be very conscious of where, what I know and what I don't. And I, I try, I try very hard to, because once you once you get a kind of platform, uh, it, it's always easy to speak on whatever and think you're an authority. So I, I'm always trying to caution myself not to speak on certain things if I really don't know. Um, 
my, I, I guess like the question that I, that I have, I'm curious of your thoughts on this. I, um, yeah. I, I'm curious what you think about in terms of something like outside of say religious ritual or, or the church, uh, what do you think about, you know, the role of say something like high culture in, in bringing some kind of interconnectedness, uh, to, to the world. Oh, well, I, think I, 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 get, I get directly involved in that project. For example, I was okay, talking okay. with uh, Candida um, uh, this morning, and this is the project I'm involved in. Give me a minute or two to describe it because I got to give you some of the context. So she approached yeah. me and um, they had this idea. Uh, they wanted to do something with the wasteland and they wanted to bring in, uh, 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 you know, dance. I mean, Elliot's poem, great poem, The Wasteland. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, sorry, <laughs> the waste on that. What? Uh, sorry, there's I a lot of there's a lot of yeah, 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 space yeah. in Canada, so I didn't know what you were yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah, sorry, sorry, that was that was that was <laughs> stupid on my part. So, anyways, um, and then she approached me because of all the work on the meeting crisis, and and then we did all this stuff, and they basically put together. Um, and it's hard to describe you, you, uh, a, a performance where there's images, there's music being mm. played, there's dance, but the dance, there are, some of them are on ropes. And so that there's a vertical dimension. And this has had a huge success. They've made it onto the top 10 of, mm. of these performances that might be brought into theaters in North America. I hope they do, because then I can go in New York and Right. And I, I wrote uh, I wrote I was not only involved in the creative production, I wrote sort of an essay for the brochure about what's going on in the wasteland and its relevancy uh, to uh, uh, the meeting crisis. And it's been a huge success. And then she said something really, really important. She said, you know, one of the most important responses is both people who knew the poem got something out of the performance and people who didn't know the poem got something deeply out of the performance. And and I've always said, uh, I, I mean, I, not always, but in the last three years, I've been saying like, this has got to go into art, right? Art before yes. argument, there has to be significant art uh, before argument. Uh, and, and so I've been involved in that project and really trying to, and the fact that there was this broad spectrum, and I was thinking of you, Paul, with your scalability issue, and she was also saying age-wise, old people to young adults, the, right? And so you were in my head, Paul, right? And, and, and it's like the fact that that's proof of concept, this is doable, and it can get a powerful response and be taken up. Uh, yes, very much. And so I, 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 I and I've, I've agreed to get involved in the second project. We're going to try and do that with another great poem. And, and again, imagine that that could be something, you know, that gets taken up and people broad spectrum, like are, are responsive to it. Yes. The answer is yes. And, 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 and yes, indeed, I am trying to do that and get involved with it in, in, a, in a significant manner. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. This is stuff that, that I'm very passionate about and interested in is uh, I, I think a lot of I think a lot of meaning and purpose and and even ritual, because when I think about liturgy, obviously, first, I think of the church, because that's what I'm, I'm largely doing. But I also think about just cultural liturgies. And I think yes. that's, yes, yes. Um, I, I have an interest, you may notice I like wear ties all the time. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a purpose for that. It's, it's, uh, I've gotten really interested in um in clothing, in manners, in, in ritual, uh, in general. Investment, uh, so there, uh, literally, yes. literally investment. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I, there's, there's a whole. I have a whole. Like, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on on those issues. But I think that we can do a lot of things just externally in, you know, appreciating the arts and in what we read, but also in how we treat others. When you, when you get rid of rules, which are, you know, like manners, you're, you're getting rid of something of yourself, you're pushing yourself inward, right? You're pushing yourself toward this kind of inner, you know, authenticity, supposedly. Um, and, and I think recapturing ritual to me is a lot broader than just the church. Oh, totally. I, you I know? mean, I, and I, I, oh, oh sorry. I'm, oh, I was just in Miami and I'm, I'm recording a course for the Peterson Academy. It's on, um, the title is um, Intelligence, Rationality, uh, wisdom and spirituality. And I, I, there's a, wh a whole bunch of new work I've been doing. It started with my talk in Cambridge uh, last February about, 
about ritual and ritual knowing and, 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 and how it's non-reducible to uh to to metaphor or drama it, it it has a it has a specific noetic and i really want to play on noesis here it has a specific noetic quality that's irreducible and irreplaceable and how powerful and but how much it actually is therefore integral to the aspirational dimension of rationality this is the work coming out of la paul and agnes keller that 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 one of the things to one of the constitutive features of being rational is to aspire to be more rational or more wise than you are. Mm -hmm. And yet this aspirational relation isn't captured by inferential rationality. And that you need these, that you need the serious play, the imaginal, and there's experimental work to show this in order to afford this, what Callard calls proleptic rationality, this aspir. So there's actually mm -hmm. deep interpenetrations sure. between this broader notion of rationality and wisdom and ritual in a profound way. I totally agree with you. On that, I think that's important to say. I the, the way all the, I mean, it starts with I think you know an important way with Kant with you know the three critiques making all making the true, the good, and the beautiful. This is Habermas, right? Making them autonomous sure. and autonomy yep. being the the absolute value over the true and the good and the beautiful. That's a yep. strange proposal. We should really think about that. Um, but we, you know we, the the idea that you, you know rational and ritual are are deeply you know deeply or uh, you know even antagonistic towards each other and yet the argument and you see it in the neoplatonic tradition how deeply mm -hmm. interpenetrating they are and interaffording and you're nodding so I, I i i get a sense that you agree with this argument yes in, very in much so way. yes it's that, just just watching this conversation unfold you know maybe i'll just have to do a commentary on a video i'm in but <laughs> you know just want to point out a few a few things here um we have what one of the one of the part of the meaning crisis i think in terms especially at scale part of the meaning crisis is the lack of a cohesive coherent culture that has art public yeah. liturgy i mean we're, we're borrowing james k smith's language yeah. on some of this stuff yeah. uh public liturgy um and and so then you know and John your your concern about okay so you've got you've got various Christian and you know there's various Jews and various Muslims too and yes. various other yes. religions it's a significant and pluralism yeah, there's very. significant pluralism yeah. and you know this of course we've got we've got globalization well, one of the things you know we've we've hardly talked about Luther which is absolutely fine. But one of the things that I, I I never realized until I read um, Erie's book Reformations that Luther was part of that first generation that comes up with the Columbian Exchange to use Charles Mann's term for you know what happens with Columbus and because the the beginning of globalization with Columbus sure um, you know part of my but part of the challenge is especially deal working with this stuff from inside the church, inside a, let's say, a conservative church, because at least in the United States and arguably within the British, um, the British realm, you you basically have Protestantism was sort of the 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 opposing container to, let's say, Catholicism or Orthodoxy or the um the caliphate. Um, and, and, and this is, and, and so that that's deeply integral into the development of the, the Anglo, the Anglo West. And, you know, th this conversation now with respect to the meaning crisis, one of the things that we've noticed is that a lot of the concerns that have been dealt with, not just in terms of the academic interest in Jordan Peterson and John Verveke, but but some of the culture war stuff is sort of concentrated in the Protestant um, Anglo world. Mm. And and so, you know, my part of my interest in this little corner in these conversations is we're recognizing the need for a coherent, cohesive culture where the public arts, because there, there wasn't public art necessarily in a Catholic or in an Orthodox and, you know, and, and then even in the classical period. I mean, these are deeply tied to religions mm -hmm. and deeply tied to all of the stuff that even secularity can identify as religion. So, you know, part part of this is 
I think part of this desire to recapture and look back is the desire for, once again, within both big P and small p Protestantism to, to understand and, and perhaps achieve something of what was achieved in the more ancient versions of Christian, you know, Constantinople, Rome, uh, that had a degree of integration that that we currently do not have, partly because of globalization, but but also significantly because of the fracturing of the institutional church within Protestantism. And so, you know, this this I think is is a piece of you know, it, it's not it's not good enough that we just can sort of play nice in the sandbox next to each other and that what we offer the world are a menu of choices, you know, to address your meaning crisis. But that that will certainly be where we're at right now. Because the Calvinist pastor will be a Calvinist pastor and the Lutherans will be Lutherans and the Catholics and the Orthodox, et cetera, et cetera. But the the deeper project is to, you know, really get at the roots here of can we have a cohesive culture with philosophy and art and public ritual that afford, you know, all of your, you know, self-transcendence, um, you know, all of the all of the language that you've put on this, John to mm -hmm. impact the meaning crisis. And, and this obviously isn't unique just to the Anglo world because, you know, the, the Catholic world and, and the Orthodox world and the Islamic world and all of the other worlds have also been deeply disrupted and penetrated by the same yes. forces that in many ways have come out of our world to them. Yes. And so yeah. I, yeah. you know, Protestant superpowers. Yes. Right? And, and so I I think that that as we think about not just the the philosophical conversations and even sort of the applied practical conversations that can be distributed to individuals suffering from this, I mean a big part for me of this conversation is an attempt to grasp all you know where we have come and how we have gotten here, and and I think for that reason conversations about institutions such as the church monastical traditions and of course the university which in some ways again is is de is right there in that mix you need all three i mean i've made this argument independently yep. the church and the monastery and the university they you know knowledge and wisdom and then the the the, uh, the living of a real life in the real world kind of thing and you need the you need them and they, they've been fractured and, and and i think that's a deep part of the meaning crisis i do want to say something about that though uh, i i've been very influenced by thomas plant's argument about uh, that Neoplatonism was basically the philosophical, spiritual analog to the Silk Road. So uh, you have the Silk Road that binds the East and the West together. And then what you find is Neoplatonism, because of this enormous capacity, historically vetted capacity to enter into reciprocal reconstruction with Christianity, with Judaism, with Islam. We have some indications with Vedanta, probably also with Buddhism, right? And, and, and there might be some, there might've been some conversations between Zen and Neoplaton, like, but to give, like I've talked about this before, you know, this courtyard of Dialogos, right? And and, and the, the, the something like the philosophical Silk Road that bound the world together it didn't mean that everybody was in agreement it didn't mean right. that you know that everybody was coming becoming a muslim or everybody was becoming a hindu or whatever but they were able to enter into these kind of deep transformative and and, and deeply beyond respect respect is important but respect is just looking at the thing they were able to enter into these reciprocally opening mutually transformative discussions and, and real dialogos such that the silk road worked like it worked, it actually worked. And, I, and I'm not saying it was a perfect and I'm not proposing utopia, but I'm saying we have an we have an example of something that was able to stitch a pluralistic world together. And I'm not saying we can return to it, I, I, neither nostalgia nor utopia, but I'm saying it is a powerful lesson we have to try and learn from. 
That is I, my that's my argument. I would argue that in many ways secularism has been the Silk Road in modernity. It, it, it has, but the problem with yeah. secularism, it, 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 right? It, it, There's it, big it, problems it, with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, see, unlike Neoplatonism, that can enter into a mutually vivifying reciprocal reconstruction, secularism is a progressive loss of the oxygen, if I if you can if I can put it that yeah. way, of like basically Christianity. I mean, I, I, I mean, you've been making this argument, Paul. I've never yeah, disagreed yeah. with this argument, yeah. right? Uh, I, I think it's what I call a derivation argument. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and I think, the, you know, Tom Holland's been making similar arguments. And I know he, he angers a lot of atheists around this. Uh, but, <laughs> but, 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 and I take those arguments seriously. I think they're important arguments. And I think there's a difference there. I think there's a, therefore a deep difference between secularism and Neoplatonism in terms of the historical record. But I, I think I think that that you know noting how these noting how pluralism has been managed and in fact mm, um yes, yes. In, in in some ways overcome. I mean, if you go back, I mean it was Voltaire that noted that at a time when you still had the caliphate and you know the um the um the the orthodox leadership and the Roman Catholic leadership warring, uh, Voltaire noted that on the docks in the Low Countries, the Muslim and the Jew and the Christian and the Protestant could all at least do business together. And and this was an argument. But, but again, I, I mean, I yeah, think yeah. what we've what where we're really at now is we're seeing we, we've we've run secularism out. We've 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 sort of played that game out all the way to the end, and we realize this is insufficient. And I think it's for that reason that I think Neoplatonism has, hey, wait a minute, but how what what past solutions have shown promise before? And I think exactly. in that way your Silk Road argument works. Um, and I think you know the Roman Catholics are sort of saying, you know, our system worked. The Orthodox are saying our system worked. We're seeking a cohesive system. And I think John, your work in particular, because unlike you know, I'm a pastor. Um, Jordan's an an academic pastor. I mean, you're a scientist too, and Jordan Peterson is a scientist, and yes. that has to be integrated into the conversation oh, yes. as well. Yeah, I, that's yeah. why we can't go back to. Uh, we can't go back to pre pre scientific Neoplatonism, right. but I would point out both at the end of the Renaissance and the beginning of the Scientific Revolution, and we've talked about this. Neoplatonism plays a significant role. It also plays a read John Spencer's book, The Eternal Law. It plays a big significant role in the reciprocal reconstruction with science at the beginning of the Einsteinian Revolution. So Neoplatonism also has a tremendous capacity to enter into a reciprocal reconstruction with science, and that also recommends it to me in a powerful way. Yeah, I think we just, there needs to be some kind of conception of a common good for any society to function. And I think this is the problem with, with secularism. And, and I'm not, like, obviously we have to deal with religious plural, pluralism. You know, I, I see these guys who are arguing for, uh, uh, you know, Christian nationalism, and we're gonna have this like state that's run by whatever, you know, whatever church tradition that person is a part of. But it just, obviously it's not realistically where we're at at this point. So uh, there, there has to be something that moving forward is beyond secularism with no common ground whatsoever, which is I think what's tearing us apart at the moment. And, you know, having a say denominational particularity running running the state, I mean, that's just not realistic. So there, there has to be some kind of unifying common good in some sense for a society to function and common ritual, common something which is, I think, what, what we're looking for. And I, I'm not contending that that, that has to be, uh, you know, Lutheranism, right? I'm not I'm not contending that we need to have a, a, an all-Lutheran state or something. <laughs> but, no, no, but, I didn't but we need you, to have... I didn't, I didn't hear you yeah, arguing yeah. for theocracy. I didn't hear that. Um, no, but, no. Uh, uh, I, I like the way you put it. In fact, I, I mean, using the title of your own book, I would I would broaden it. We we need we need we need a common good. We need a common beautiful. We need a common true. I mean, we need a, yes. we need a way in which uh, people can explore and develop and be challenged in their love for the true, the good, and the beautiful, rather than just yeah. telling them to do it within their own private subjectivity. I think that yes, has yes. been a deeply failed project. 
I mean, because the, 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 and I, I think you agree with me from what I've read of the book, trying to encompass the true, the good, and the beautiful within subjectivity is just doomed to fail. From it's, it's almost it's all it's almost oxymoronic. Yep. And I think one of the things that COVID showed is when people are thrown back on just to the resources of their subjectivity, it is grotesquely inadequate for yes, meeting yes. the needs for religio, for connectedness, for the cultivation of wisdom, et cetera. Totally. And, and, and so, you know, the, the question then is, I mean, you have both the immediate application triage and treatment in terms of the meaning crisis. If we want to frame it in, let's say, therapeutic or medical terms. Yeah. Um, but but also it's got to and, you know, it's got to scale up into the academy. I mean, we, we talk about mm-hmm. church, monastery, um, university, yeah. academy, but, you know, there's also government and <laughs> and and you know that you know jordan peterson has been obviously much more harping on government issues and the rest of us sort of said so i'll yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll vote <laughs> i'll talk in my living room but i'm not going to talk on the internet well, uh, about for that me, it's not it's not just practical i, I have philosophical disagreements with conceiving of the political arena as the place in which the meaning crisis can be properly addressed. I right, think it. Right. I think it has been totally captured. I think ideological capture is a specific political instantiation of propositional tyranny, and I do. And I think that for that very reason. Now I will vote too, and I. I but I. But you know, uh, I voted for a prime minister who promised electoral reform and then didn't deliver it because I think we need electoral reform. I was in the Czech Republic and they're really proposing it in a way that could make a difference. Like if you replace first past the post with you know the d21 proposal first past the post re- rewards popularism it rewards polarization these alternatives and they've been modeled and in in small scale demonstrations they've been demonstrated to they punish popularism they punish polarization they make people look at more than one candidate and learn about the other candidates in a deep way i mean there are things we can do so i'm willing to talk metapolitical at that level but in the political realm i think the political realm it, I, I think it's broken beyond repair. Right. Uh, why think... this swings back now into Protestantism is because these mechanisms, what you just talked about, John. Yep. This is this is Protestant ecclesiology, the fight that we're having in the Christian Reformed Church. It's about votes. Um, you know, m- this world that we are wrestling with this meaning crisis in is fundamentally a Protestant world. Yes. Small P. And I think that's why um, I think Jordan's argument is right. And Gavin, who's another YouTuber in, in Protestant land, and I've, I've seen them sort of itching to get in on this. But but I think that is why, you know, to have the Catholics around, in many ways, the Catholics have been outperforming Protestants in North America. And I think that's partly because they actually have a root and a tradition of a much more, and I think it's just down there in the DNA, even if it's not up there in the consciousness, that there's certain practice, as do Jews and often Muslims. Protestants, although have been working on this stuff for a very long time, but so much of all of this Protestantism in our systems, we're simply not self-aware of it because it's just simply too close. And so I think it's healthy then to say, oh yeah, there's there's basically and and I would also argue that Catholicism as practiced in America very Protestant way and looking at people like Christian reform ministers who have now gone into orthodoxy that church that orthodox church that develops in the Anglo Protestant West will it be in some strange ways very different from the church the immigrants tried to bring over <laughs> and we're going to watch yeah. that play out in their institutions so I, I think you already i think you already see that in the oca it's a very protestant orthodox church <laughs> yes that, that's just inevitable culturally you're going to bring your kind of prior commitments and culture and how you've been formed into into your new group whatever that might be and and so uh, as we have these conversations uh, yeah i i think in many ways it, even the format of these conversations is deeply protestant and it's it's going to be sort of inescapable in similar ways that it's deeply postmodern in some ways. I, I, I'm not denying any of that. In fact, I, I make similar arguments. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying, though, 
to <laughs> re-foreground the Socratic Platonic practices around dialogue and contemplation um, mm -hmm. such that we can bring those back because they are deeply rooted in our historical, at least, philosophical DNA. And if we can uh, re exapt them, then I think we can we can inform and transform that conversation in powerful ways. That's that's what I'm proposing. And what I like yeah. about what Jordan's project is, is he's, he's in a way saying, hey, you know what? Protestants have actually been working on these things with an eye to the classical period for a very long time. And part of the difficulty, and John, as, as you noticed in, in some of your journey through Protestant churches, um, the application of this has not been terribly well connected with the um, the intelligentsia of the Protestant churches. There is definitely a trickle down that still happens in Protestantism, but you do not have in Protestantism a similar situation that maybe like you had with Joseph Ratzinger, where you had a, a real, you know, a very intelligent academic, someone, or or Pope John Paul, I don't know much as much about Pope Francis. Ratzinger is a philosopher through and through. Yeah. That's right. But, but they put the philosopher at the head of the church. Usually yeah. right now, especially in the Americas, you have someone who's sort of like more of an entrepreneur at the head of the column. And so, I mean, this is all of what's what's happening on the ground. And and I think part of the excitement of what we're seeing now via YouTube is that in some ways, people who are who are in sitting in the pew church pews going to church now who basically they have their local pastor, they will never read a theology book. Now suddenly whole new ideas are being opened up to them. Yeah. Well, it's I a mean, remarkable I, I, thing. I want I want I want to acknowledge uh, you know Jordan's point about, you know, he said in the last 10 even 5 years this has really taken off and there's something happening. Um and I, 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 I'm not claiming any authority or doorman or being anything like that. But yeah, Jordan, you should be part of this conversation. That's that's apparently obvious to me. What you're talking about, uh, what you're bringing to bear here, I think it's relevant and important. Uh, and so, I mean, one of the functions about this is, uh, uh, you know, to I guess to 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 say welcome. Um, uh, and I think you should be in these conversations. I think you have. Uh, you 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 have both deep connectedness and important differences that would make real dialogos possible in these conversations in this little, little corner of the internet. I think that you've convinced me of that. Um, both in, well, I appreciate in, that. Yeah, and what you've been saying here, I, I think that I think that's uh, I think that case has been well made, to my mind at least. Well, thank you. A anything Thanks. else anybody wants to say? I don't it's know been a great is... conversation. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks for taking the time to do this, both of you. Well, I wanted to do it. I mean, and, and um, like I said before, I mean, I get lot, and you, and, and and you'll see it more as you get involved. To it. Like I, right? I get a lot of criticisms that are just insults and ridicule and and all that. Oh, I, I, I get plenty of it. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, you have a particular religious stance, so that makes you more liable to these. Yeah. I can see that. Um, but you know, you didn't do that. You came in, you said what you appreciated about my work. There was respect. And then you made arguments. Um, and then you took my, you, you took my responses seriously. Your, your brief comment was like, I was, was nice. Um, uh, and I don't mean that in, in the trivial, polite sense. It was, yeah, yeah, sure. It was respectful. Um, and so, you know, and then I wanted to, I wanted to have this conversation because I wanted to, I wanted to ask, you, you allowed me, you were very gracious. You allowed me to ask a lot of questions and some of them were challenging and difficult and you know sort of put you made you put your neck out a bit and you i appreciated you meeting them and responding to them and um, so that's why i you know that's why i just said what i said thank you beautiful well maybe that's the place to land the plane and i'll i'll end the recording